Today on Cook's Country, Julia and Bridget make show-stopping cider-braised pork roast. Jack challenges Bridget to a tasting of sauerkraut. And Brian Cook's Pittsburgh-inspired cheddar potato pierogi for Julia. That's all right here on Cook's Country. The next time you take a sip of cider, thank honeybee. <laughs> Honeybees were first shipped to the New World back in 1622 by English settlers. The bees were essential to the pollination of apple trees, which were used for making cider. And that cider played a vital role in early American settlements. It was not only a drink, both fresh and fermented, but it was a source of nourishment during the long cold winters. It was crucial for pickling in the form of vinegar, and it was used as currency to pay off debts. Well, today we get a payoff, and that is cider braised pork roast. So let's head into the kitchen and see how it's done. A special occasion pork roast is a great thing for any good home cook to have in their back pocket, or mm -hmm. front pocket for that matter. <laughs> and this is a doozy. It's tender and juicy, and we're going to play on that fun combination of pork and apples. That is a classic. So to start, you have to choose the right cut of pork, and the pork shoulder is where it's at, also known as the Boston butt. And today we're using a five to six pounder, and it's got the bone in, because that bone adds serious flavor. All right, so notice we have a good fat cap on this, and this has been trimmed to about a quarter of an inch. Do a slight cross hatch in the fat cap. Let me make these slashes about an inch apart. So there we have it. And now we're gonna coat this with a combination of a quarter cup of salt and a quarter cup of brown sugar. I'm just gonna really rub it into the pork roast on all sides. And this does a few things. One, it obviously adds some good flavor, but two, it'll help draw out some of the moisture in the pork, but then that pork will reabsorb the moisture with the salt and sugar, so it'll help flavor it. We're gonna let this sit in the refrigerator for 18 to 24 hours. So we're gonna wrap the pork in plastic wrap because it'll help keep that salt and sugar mixture on. Here is a pork that's been sitting for at least 18 hours with that salt and sugar rub. And before we brown this guy up in the pot, you wanna make sure to brush off any extra salt or sugar that's hanging out. So some of that sugar and salt has been absorbed into the meat, but the rest, you gotta get rid of it. Mm-hmm, all right, that looks pretty good. Last but not least, we're gonna season this guy with a little bit of pepper, top and bottom, and a little on the sides, a little on the back side, a little on that side. <laughs> this is ready to get seared. There's three tablespoons of vegetable oil in this pot. It's been heating up over medium-high heat. You wanna sear this on all sides, and it's about three minutes a side, six sides, a little less than 20 minutes. Okay. All right, so while this guy is searing, we'll keep an eye on it. We're gonna prep just a few ingredients to help flavor the sauce. We haven't talked much about the sauce. You've never mentioned it. <laughs> no, we're gonna do cider. I mentioned apples, and so cider really pairs nicely with the pork, mm. so we're gonna make a cider sauce. Now, to bring that cider over to the savory side, we're gonna add some basic aromatics, like an onion. All right, so here, I'm just gonna take this nice, big, yellow onion. I'm gonna slice it into nice, thin slices. So now we're gonna add a little bit of garlic, and this is six cloves of garlic. I'm just gonna smash them with a knife. You can even do it with the skins on, and the skins just fall right off. So that's all the garlic. Put that back in the bowl. And let's go take a look at our pork roast. Oh, it smells good. Doesn't it smell kind of bacony? Yes, it does. Oh, all right, now sometimes this guy's a little slippery, Ooh. so using two tongs is good. So we're gonna continue to brown all the sides, and that'll take eh, about 15 more minutes. As you can see, we've continued to brown this roast on all sides. It's even more bacony. <laughs> There's a little bit of browning in the bottom of the pot, that's good. So in go the onions, and I'm just gonna sprinkle them around the pork, right into all that fat in the bottom of the pot. And we're gonna add six cloves of garlic. Oh, I know, oh. I know that pork fat smells really good mm -hmm. with the onions and garlic. And I'm just gonna stir these until they soften, and that takes about two minutes. Doesn't that just <laughs> smell amazing? You can see how nice and golden they've gotten mm -hmm. from the sugar and a little bit of that pork fat. That's gonna make that sauce taste amazing. And speaking of sauce, we're gonna add one and three quarter cups apple cider. This is the base for the entire sauce. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. To help bring out those flavors, we're gonna add a cinnamon stick, because of course, apples and cinnamon go together. Mm -hmm. And to help with the savory edge, we're gonna add about six sprigs of thyme. I'm just gonna add them to different parts of the pot. And two bay leaves. All right, so it's simmering now. We're just gonna put the lid on this. We're gonna cook it in a 275 degree oven. That low, slow heat will make the pork so tender and juicy. It's gonna take about two and a half hours. We're looking for an internal temperature of 190. <laughs> 
Oh, I can smell it from here. Are you ready? Yes. <gasps> yeah, you smell the pork, you smell the cider, you smell the herbs and the cinnamon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, now it's time to temp it because it's been in there for about two and a half hours. <laughs> Again, we're looking for a temperature of about 190. There we are. So if you wouldn't mind snugging that board up. Again, the two tong system. Oh, oh, hello. All right, I'll see you later. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you. We have to let this rest for at least 30 minutes before we slice into it. Let those muscles relax and let them reabsorb some of their moisture. Mm. We're gonna tent it with foil, keep it warm. And to keep Bridget away from it. <laughs> now in this pot is an amazing amount of flavor and an amazing amount of fat. So we're gonna keep the flavor, lose the fat so we don't have a greasy sauce. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna strain it to get rid of those solids. That's the onion and all the herbs and the garlic. And I'm gonna put this liquid into a fat separator. It'll make it much easier for us to get rid of all the fat so we have a nice smooth sauce without being too greasy. And then just before serving, we're gonna to whip together a quick sauce. Yep. Still there? Still there. <laughs> all right, so we're gonna finish the sauce and we're gonna add even more apple flavor by adding apples. Who'd have thunk it? So we're gonna add two Braeburn apples because they're good and sweet and they hold their shape. I'm gonna cut this apple into eight even wedges. Uh, you could use John of Gold if you couldn't find Braeburns. And you know, we tried adding apples to this dish in a lot of ways. We put them in the pot, we let them braise, we put them in the beginning, we add them halfway through, but really they just disintegrated alongside the pork. We found it best to just brown them a little bit right before serving. All right, so into a bowl. Again, this is two apples. I'm gonna season them with a little salt and pepper. All right, so we're gonna brown these apples in the pot, and guess what I'm gonna use for the fat? Let's hope pork fat. You know it. All right, so you can see this liquid has been sitting here Ooh. for a while. I know, look at that pure pork fat on top. I'm gonna take about a tablespoon and a half of the pure, clear <gasps> pork fat right mm. off the top. So I'm gonna heat this fat up over medium high heat. All right, so that fat's been heating up for a couple minutes and it's starting to shimmer. Sure so it's is. It's time to add our apples. Mm. And I'm just gonna arrange them so that they're cut side down. We're gonna brown both cut sides. Okay. a couple minutes per side. Beautiful, absolutely gorgeous. All right, so I turn the heat off and I'm gonna take them out of the pan. I love how the skins also sort of lighten in color and the red parts get nice and rosy. Mm -hmm. Blush. Oh, mm-hmm. And if you wouldn't mind tenting these with foil, that just will help keep them nice and warm. On to the last and best part of this recipe, the sauce. And here I'm just gonna take some paper towels and just wipe off any gunky bits right. left over. So here we have the braising liquid that's been sitting and defouting. You can see that liquid gold on the top. Oh yes. So I'm just gonna put this right on top of a liquid measuring cup. And we're looking for about two cups of defatted juice. All right, there we go. I'm gonna add this right back to the pan. And you know, we wanted to obviously thicken this up into a nice sauce. And one of our ideas to lend it more apple flavor was to use apple butter quarter of a cup. It's gonna give it a really nice apple flavor. I'm gonna put this over a high heat and bring it to a boil. Look at the change in color in mm -hmm. there. Oh, so good. Oh, yes. smell that. Very apple -y. between mm. the caramelized apples, the apples you browned in there, the apple cider, now apple butter. Mm -hmm. I'm apple happy. <laughs> you can see it's coming to a simmer and it's time to add our thickener, which is cornstarch. Whenever you use cornstarch, you wanna mix it with a little liquid first. That's a tablespoon of cornstarch into a quarter cup of more cider. And then we're gonna whisk this into the simmering sauce. And presto changeo, this becomes a thickened sauce. So I'm gonna turn the heat off. I'm gonna finish this with just a little kick of vinegar. This is a tablespoon of cider vinegar. Again, that just gives the sauce a little bit of punch. And of course, a pinch of salt, a pinch of pepper. All right, so I'm gonna put this off the heat. And now it's time to dive into our pork roast. There's this bone here, and you see it's sort of this T-shaped bone. Mm -hmm. And we wanna get that out. And this is where you wanna take a knife, either a paring knife or a sharp boning knife. I'm gonna hold the bone with one hand and just try to slice the meat away. It's a cursive T-shaped bone. <laughs> it is, it's a funky shaped bone. Now I'm just gonna slice the rest of this pork into about half inch thick slices. <gasps> oh, hello. Juicy, oh mm -hmm. my goodness. <laughs> I have to say, I love the little shreddy bits that fall off the top and yes. the bottom as you slice. Mm. Oh. I'm gonna give you a nice, Big thick slice and a few apples. Thank you. Last but not least, our sauce. So not least. <laughs> okay, come on. Look, look at this. It's falling <laughs> off my fork. It's so tender. It's falling off my fork and into my mouth. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. 
there is bacon present, even though you did not put it in the pot. Nope. I would swear that it has that kind of salty, smoky, sultry bacon flavor. Well, and the sauce, the sauce is the perfect marriage of cider and pork. Yes, and really the perfect texture. Mm. Just that little bit of cornstarch and the apple butter too. Mm -hmm. Great amount of thickening. This is bar none, my favorite pork roast, especially with apples. Mm -hmm. Cheers, Julian. That was absolutely amazing. Isn't it good? So if you'd like to make a tender and juicy cider braised pork roast at home, well, you've got to start with a bone-in pork shoulder and dry rub it all over with salt and brown sugar. And let that seasoning penetrate the meat overnight. Next, brown the roast and add some aromatics, onions and garlic, before slow braising it all in an apple cider broth until that meat is fall apart tender. Then sear some Braeburn apples in the flavorful pork fat and combine the braising liquid, apple butter, and apple cider, plus a little cornstarch, for a most delectable sauce filled with apple flavor. And there you have it from Cook's Country, a special occasion, fit for a special friend, mm -hmm. cider braised pork roast. Great audience today, and today we're tasting sauerkraut. Now in German, sauerkraut means soured cabbage. You can make your own at home, but it takes at least six weeks really for that flavor to develop. So it's much easier to buy the pre-made stuff, and Jack's gonna tell us which one is best. I have three samples here for you, and it's interesting. A lot of people think, oh, it's pickled, and it's not, it's fermented. Mm -hmm. And so it is just shredded cabbage and salt and basically time. Right. Uh, you, you know, old fashioned, you'd put it in a barrel and you'd wait six weeks and the yeast and bacteria that's naturally floating in the air would convert the natural sugars in the cabbage to lactic acid, which is what gives it that tart flavor. And people think, oh, it's pickled because it's got that vinegary flavor, right. but there's no vinegar in it. So we did the tasting the way we're doing it here, but we also did it in a hot dog where the big pieces were a detriment because they're gonna fall out. Mm -hmm. Or we did it inside a pierogi where you really want a very fine, evenly chopped, I know no pierogies, no hot dogs, you're just getting bowls of sauerkraut. I love sauerkraut on a hot dog. Oh. One of my favorite ways to eat a hot dog. Now some brands add preservatives. As it turns out, the ones with preservatives are the ones in the refrigerator case because the plastic bags they use in the refrigerator case are porous and it will oxidize the cabbage over mm -hmm. time. And so they put these preservatives that you can taste. Some of these will have a little bit of what I would call a chemical aftertaste that is coming from the preservatives that they're adding. And we found that the shelf stable versions, the ones that are either in a jar or in a can, taste fresher than the ones that are in really? the refrigerator case. So usually you think, oh, the refrigerator case is gonna be fresher tasting and it's a higher quality. In this case, the best sauerkraut is in a jar or in a can. So what are you thinking of these sauerkrauts? <laughs> <laughs> definitely sour. I definitely have a favorite. All right. And it would be this one. Very bright, very tangy. It's a little bit moist, which I like. Mm -hmm. This one is still a little crunchy, which isn't bad. I wouldn't mind more seasoning on that. Okay. This one, not crazy about. It's just kind of dull and flat. All right. So where would you like to start? Let's start with this one in the middle. All right. You are starting with the loser. Yeah. Uh, so this is the Deetson Watson. It's one of the ones that's in the refrigerator case. It's in that plastic bag. And it just doesn't have the freshness and the sort of tartness, sourness that you really want. Yeah, this is just bag cabbage almost to me. You want to go to this one next? Yeah. So this is the Eden. This is the audience's favorite okay. and the winner. This is in a jar, but I gotta say, there was a runner-up. Okay. And you chose the runner-up. This is the Libby's that's in a can. Hmm. And really, either a jar or a can, it's pretty much the same. There are no preservatives in it. It's just the cabbage and salt. Those are the best choices. Well, there you go. There is a winning sauerkraut. If you like the runner-up, like I did, go for Libby sauerkraut. But if you wanna go with the winner, it's Eden Organic Sauerkraut. <laughs> Before the First World War, roughly two and a half million Polish immigrants arrived here in the U.S., and many of them moved to Pennsylvania to work in the state's booming coal and steel industries. In fact, by 1920, a third of the workforce in Pittsburgh were Polish Americans. So it's no surprise that Pittsburgh is known for their Polish food, including kielbasa, bagels, and pierogi, those little dumplings filled with potatoes. And that's what Brian is going to show us how to make today. Now, Brian, you actually went to Pittsburgh to learn how to do it right. Right. I learned how to eat a ton of pierogies <laughs> is what I learned. So we spent time with restaurateurs, with home cooks, and we learned how to make pierogies. I learned that there's many different types. There's those that are filled with jalapenos and bacon what? and sauerkraut and dried prunes with all manner of things. But the basic recipe we're going to make today 
is cheddar cheese and potato. Mm. And so we're gonna start with the potatoes. So I have one pound of russet potatoes. Now why are you choosing russets over any other kind of potato? Because russets will give us a lighter, fluffier texture. And we'll slice the potato in half inch thick slices. And that's a good idea whenever you're cooking potatoes, like mashed potatoes or what have you, to cut them into slices rather than cubes because they'll cook through more evenly. We'll combine all the potatoes in the pot with a tablespoon of salt, and we'll cover that with water by about one inch. We'll bring this to a boil, and once that comes to a boil, we'll reduce the heat to medium, and we'll cook it at a strong simmer until the potatoes are very tender. Okay, Julia, so the potatoes have been boiling for 15 minutes, and we can take a peek and see that they're fully tender. We'll just go over here and drain these off. Okay, now we can drop the potatoes straight into the stand mixer. So these are still really hot. Yeah, and that's an important thing here, because we're gonna combine them with the cheddar cheese and the butter. And you wanna make sure they're hot so they fully incorporate and melt both those items. So, one cup of sharp cheddar cheese, two tablespoons of butter, half teaspoon of salt, and a half teaspoon of pepper. So we're gonna mix this for about one minute until it's fully melted. Okay. That smells good. Right. We want to chill this while we make the dough. The quickest way to do that is to put it in a nice shallow dish like this eight inch square baking pan. We're going to drop this in the refrigerator and let it chill for at least 30 minutes or up there a full 24 hours. So while the filling chills, we're going to turn our attention to the dough. This wonderful woman named Elaine Kitlowski in Mount Lebanon, Pennsylvania, took us into her home for a day and taught us how to make pierogies based on her grandmother's recipe. Now she uses a combination of all-purpose and semolina flours, which makes it a relatively high protein dough, so it's nice and elastic. Rather than call for two different types of flours, we settled on bread flour. Which has a higher protein content than all-purpose flour. Right, so we have two and a half cups of bread flour here. We're gonna add one teaspoon of baking powder, one half teaspoon of salt, We'll just whisk this together to combine it. We can go ahead and add one cup of sour cream. This is a pretty interesting dough. Right, we're adding fat and richness without adding too much moisture to it. So you'll find when we're done mixing this up that the dough is extremely easy to work with. If you have favorite doughs in life, <laughs> which I never thought I'd say, this is gonna be one of my favorite doughs. Really, this is yeah. your favorite dough, all right. Favorite dough, I don't know what else to do with it besides make pierogies, but that's a good start. So I have one whole egg and one egg yolk. We're gonna fit the mixture with a dough hook, and we'll mix this on medium-high speed for about eight minutes until the dough really hydrates and it gets nice and elastic. Okay, Julia, the dough has been rested for at least 20 minutes here. You can see how nice and... I gotta touch it. Yeah, it's Ooh. nice and pliable, isn't it? That's gonna be a good dough to work with. So we're ready to roll this out. We wanna start with a little bit of bench flour. You don't wanna overflour this board because the pierogies are gonna seal without the aid of water, so too much flour prevents the seal from happening. We want to start off by rolling this into an 18 inch circle. And that just gives you the best thinness for the dough. Right. It comes out to be about an eighth of an inch thick. So we have a three inch biscuit cutter. We're going to go around and cut out as many rounds as possible. We have about enough filling for 30 pierogi. Okay, so we're now ready to start adding the filling. We're going to use one level tablespoon measure. See that the filling is nicely chilled. And we'll just kind of slide that into each pierogi. This looks like it takes a lot of patience to make these. It does. This is a little something we like to call pierogatory in the kitchen. Because <laughs> you're staring down the barrel of 24 pierogies that you now have to fold and crimp <laughs> and make look perfect. Why don't we start folding them? Okay? All right. I'm going to teach you All right. the way I was taught. And give it a simple fold right in the middle. And kind of just give it a little pinch. Then work over sliding to the left. And then I like to come around from one end and just give it a, a solid pinch. And this in lieu of the water is what really makes it stick together. Okay, and we can just place them onto a lightly floured sheet of parchment. You know, if you don't get a perfect seal on them and they break apart yeah. in the boiling water, those are called angels. Oh no! Yeah, it's an adorable name for them. But it's an adorable they, name for a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> I got the feeling I'm making some angels over here. <laughs> I'm an angel maker. See, it doesn't even sound bad. No, it doesn't. <laughs> another few minutes for this batch. We'll roll out the second batch of dough and hopefully get another six cut and we're ready to boil them off. Okay, Julia, we got our full 30 pierogi. So now we can turn to our garnish. I have four tablespoons of melted butter here over medium-low heat. I'm gonna add one large onion that's been minced and a half teaspoon of salt. And we'll cook this until the onions are nicely caramelized. And this will take about 15 to 20 minutes. And now we can turn our attention to cooking the pierogi. Right, we have a large pot of boiling water here. We're gonna add one tablespoon of salt. 
and we're going to add half of our pierogi, so about 15 pierogi. And the reason why we're only adding half is because we don't want to cool the water down too much. Now, a lot of recipes I've seen, they tell you the pierogi's done when they start to float. Is there any truth to that? Remember, we have to cook that dough all the way through, and we want to make sure we heat that filling back up. Let them go for the full five minutes. Okay, Julia, the second batch is done. Ooh, that means it's eating time. Yep. So we can go right into the skillet with the caramelized onions with the first batch. In order to carry the onions a little bit further, we'll add a couple tablespoons of this cooking water. I was thinking the onions look like they need a little loosening up. Yeah, and they need to warm up a little bit too. So we're gonna hit them over medium low heat for just a couple of minutes. And we'll toss all the pierogi in that onion oh, mixture. Oh, goodness. That looks terrible. <laughs> but not this watering right now. <laughs> so right onto the platter. Oh. Let's get the rest of those onions. Oh, yeah. Maybe just a little more. Yeah, that looks good. Is that good? Well, my fork just went right through that dough. It's not like a rubbery lead sinker at all. Mmm. Mmm. Man. I don't think I've ever had a pierogi this good. You know, they're filling, but they're not going to weigh you down. And that was kind of my, my measure of great pierogies when I was in Pittsburgh. Could I eat more than two or three without <laughs> feeling like I was going to have to take a nap? <laughs> To make the ultimate potato and cheddar pierogi, start with rust potatoes and sharp cheddar cheese. Using a stand mixer, beat the two together until smooth, then spread the filling into a square baking dish and chill it until firm. To make a supple, easy to roll out dough, use bread, flour, and sour cream, along with some baking powder and egg. After rolling out the dough and cutting out three inch rounds, use one tablespoon of filling before giving it your own personalized crimp edge. To cook the pierogi, boil them in salted water for exactly five minutes, then toss with caramelized onions before serving. And there you have it, from Cook's Country, the best recipe for potato cheddar pierogi. You can get this recipe along with all of our tastings, testings, and select episodes at our website at cookscountry.com. Thanks for watching Cook's Country from America's Test Kitchen. So what'd you think? Leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or just say hi. Now you can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. Alligator. <laughs>